Okay, so good evening and welcome everyone. We're going to have a class today about the preliminaries. So remember that we mentioned whilst we were doing the preliminaries of the session, there was mention of some preliminary practices. There are five main, main preliminary practices and we need to accumulate 100,000 of each one of them. So just to enumerate the list of five, the, and there is a particular order usually in which we do them. The first one is going for refuge. The second one is making prostrations. The third one is accumulating the, or reciting the 100,000 syllable mantra. The fourth one is offering mandala. And the fifth one is petitioning the guru uh, by means of reciting the mitzema. So it is very clearly stated that in order to train properly in the lamrim, in the stages of the path, and to be able to generate the realizations, we need to um, accumulate the, or you know, complete those four types of preliminaries, as we say, each one of them has to has to happen a hundred thousand times. So the first practice is the practice of refuge, because with we need first of all to establish the certainty and the valid awareness in terms of the objects of refuge. Following that, the next thing that we want to do is to remove adverse con conditions that stops us from generating realizations. So this is why after refuge, we do the prostrations and the hundred syllable mantra. We also need to amass uh, merit and uh, favorable conditions. And this is the reason why we make the mandala offering. And finally, in order to quickly generate realizations in the path, we need to receive the blessing of the guru. So we make this petition to the guru by means of the mitzema. So this is the general uh, way that we do them. Okay, so uh, we say that we begin with the first preliminary, which is uh, the refuge. We have to accumulate 100,000 times uh, recitations of the refuge formula. Ideally, you would have a special room in your house that you use as your room for practice. And... Um, in that room, you have to organize your seat and prepare the room properly. So first of all, you have to clean the place. And uh, so you dust it, you sweep and so forth. And once the place is clean, you arrange representations of the Buddha's body, speech and mind. So whatever stupas or pictures or statues you have, and you have to arrange those in the proper manner. So in an unmistaken way. Having cleaned the place and having organized representations of Buddha's of the Buddha's of the Buddha's body, speech, and mind, then you make offerings. So according to your uh, financial capacity and so forth, or whatever is available, make sure you organize and uh, put out nicely some some good quality offerings, the best that you can afford, nice flowers and incense and so forth. Then. Um, where you're going to place your seat, before you place the seat on the ground, you take some white earth or maybe white chalk might do it, um, and you draw um, the symbol of a, right, of a clockwise swastika. Actually, the, the actual instruction is that you have to draw the symbol of a double cross Vajra. But because the double cross Vajra is a hand implement of a deity, it's inappropriate to be on the ground and you sitting on top of it. And therefore, what we do, instead of having the double cross Vajra, we have the Svastika, the symbol of the Svastika. It's a round, round clock Svastika. Then on top of that, we arrange a few strands of... Uh, uh, durwa uh, grass and kusha grass. Each one of them has its own purpose and significance. So the, we have to make sure that the grass is clean, it's unmixed, unmatted, and with the kusha grass we want all the 
all the little sticks of the kusha, gra kusha grass to be intact and uh, you know facing the same direction so unmixed and unbroken then on top of that we arrange our seat it is very good if the seat is elevated a little bit at the back and a bit lower at the front the reason why we put uh, these two types of grass is because we want to have stability in our practice and we want to avoid having obstacles. In particular, the kusha grass is said to bring about clarity in terms of our visualization. And the durwa glass, grass is auspicious interdependence for a long and stable life. As for the svastika, the symbol of svastika is there for us to remind us the activities of Buddha Shakyamuni as he sat um, under the body tree in Bodh Gaya and obtained enlightenment and just bring that into mind and you say I'm a follower and I will do likewise okay so once we have arranged all this uh, the next thing is to assume our place in the seat and we say that we assume the eight poster of Arochana. We have mentioned that there are seven physical points involved in that and if we include the breathing in that, it, they become eight points. We have already mentioned those so we will not go over them again. Once we have sat in the proper posture, the next thing is to actually establish the motivation. It is uh, very like, likely that um, there might be some afflictions or various ideas in our mind and these things need to be removed and purified therefore at the very beginning what we do is to establish motivation if we don't establish the right motivation what happens is that even though we do various practices and we might put a lot of effort in doing those practices at the end the results will not be anything good what the Kadampa Geshes uh, used to say is that there are two important activities, one at the beginning and one at the end. So the important activity at the beginning is setting the motivation properly. And whether or not the actual practice that you do in the actual part of the session is a Mahayana practice or not depends on whether or not you have uh, the bodhicitta motivation. If you are influenced by this bodhicitta motivation, then the dharma that you practice or the practice that you do is a Mahayana, motiva um, Mahayana practice. So we have to begin uh, by thinking that since beginningless time, I have experienced the suffering of samsara in general, and in particular, the suffering that comes with rebirths in the lower migrations. And I have experienced this countless times. Today, I have come to have this incredible opportunity where I have obtained a precious human rebirth. I have met with the teachings. I have met with a spiritual guide who is able to guide me through the path in an unmistaken manner. Uh, there are all these instructions that are available for me to practice. And I have all these favorable conditions. And this is the result of my previous karma and aspiration. So the time has come together that right now that I have all these favorable conditions. If I do not make the effort and if I do not achieve enlightenment now that I have everything going for me, I will have to experience this type of suffering in samsara again and again in an unending and unbearable manner. And everywhere I look within samsara, everywhere, anywhere I take rebirth in any of the six types of migrations, the nature of that existence is the nature of suffering. And it is not just myself who is uh, suffering and finds suffering unbearable, but if I look around me, all those sentient beings that surround me, they also experience suffering. So as I observe those sentient beings who experience suffering, I become aware that they have been very kind to me. They are only kind to me, not just once or twice, but countless times. So for their sake, I am resolved to reach the state of enlightenment. Therefore, I will go for refuge and I will do this practice of refuge properly. So in this way, 
we generate the Mahayana motivation. So we want to be influenced by the mind of bodhicitta. And we have to spend a bit of time in the beginning until we set up the motivation in a way that it moves us emotionally. So don't rush through this. As beginners, we have to try to generate more, um, the motivation of bodhicitta um, gradually in stages. So you say, I think this, then I think that, then I think the other. So we have to make that properly, right? So we must have this very strong uh, thought at the end that there is no other way. I have to reach enlightenment. So I'm going to start the practice today and I'm doing it by practicing refuge properly. So we're talking here about setting the motivation and we say that setting the motivation is actually very important. So we will illustrate this through the example of four people. So imagine you have four people, they're all doing the same practice, they're all reciting uh, the mantra of Tara 21 times. Uh, they do exactly the same number of recitation. However, they do it with different thoughts in their mind. The first person is afraid of um, harm that might come to them from human or non-human creatures. And uh, they uh, recite the mantra of Tara for protection from that type of harm. The second type of person uh, has, knows that they have accumulated negativity and they are afraid that in the next rebirth, they might fall into the lower migrations and have to experience suffering there. So they are reciting the tar mantras for some protection for future suffering. The third type of person is thinking that even though in the next life they might uh, have a good rebirth, nevertheless, they will not have total freedom from samsara. So disgusted with the situation in samsara, they are reciting tara mantras in order to obtain liberation from samsara. And then finally, you have the fourth type of person. And the fourth type of person is thinking that just as I find suffering unbearable, so too all other sentient beings around me who have been extremely kind to me in every occasion, they also suffer. And I cannot bear to see them suffering. I cannot stand their suffering. And I need to reach a state of omniscience in order to be able to guide them and benefit them. But until I reach that state of omniscience, I won't have the capacity to do it. Therefore, I'm reciting these uh, Tara mantras in order to reach that state. So as you can see, these people are doing exactly the same practice, but... Um, they have completely different motivations. In the first case, actually the practice does not even qualify to be called Dharma. In the next three cases, the practice qualifies to be called Dharma. But in the second case, where they're thinking about escaping the suffering of the future lower migrations, it is the Dharma of the individual of the small scope. In the case of the third person, it is the Dharma of the individual of the middle scope. And it is only in the case of the fourth person that it is the Dharma of the individual of the great scope. And these differences that we have are different due to the motivation okay all right so um okay so um as we say at the beginning of every activity we need to establish the motivation once the motivation is established we have to begin establishing the visualization of the objects of refuge so this is a visualization that we have to establish in the space in front of us and it's very good to have it at a comfortable level it should not be too high it should not be too low so you place the visualization in front of you and about the level between your eyebrows and it should be in a distance that if you stretch your arms, you will be able to touch them. So they're not too far away. Okay, so in the space in front of you, you begin by visualizing a very vast throne. This is a very big throne that is supported by uh, snow lions. And it is quite high, um, high and vast. On that very big throne, you place another five thrones. So you have a throne at the center that is slightly bigger 
And then you have the throne to its right, to its left, one at the back and one at the front. So let's concentrate now at the central throne. That central throne has uh, uh, three seats on it. The first layer of seat is um, a variegated lotus. On top of that, we, had, we have the sun. And on top of that, we have the moon seat. And on top of that three-tier seat, you have a figure. The nature of that figure is your own root guru. So the guru who has been most kind to you, has given you the advice that has benefited you the most, that is uh, the nature of the figure there. However, the aspect of that main figure is the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. So the color of his body is the color of very fine, refined gold. He has a body that is radiating light. He has the Ushnishna at the crown of the head. He is, um, has one face and two arms. The right arm, arm is touching the earth. The left arm is in the mudra of equipoise and is holding a banging bowl that is filled with nectar. He's dressed with the three types of robes, the color of saffron. He's marked, he's showing all the major marks and the secondary signs. His body radiates light and that light spreads out and illuminates every realm in every direction. And he sits there uh, with his legs crossed. So now from his heart, we he visualize four rays of light spreading out in the four directions because remember he is surrounded by four thrones so each one of those streams of light will head towards the direction one to the right the left one to the back one to the front in each one of those smaller thrones again we have the three tier seats okay so now Behind, at the throne behind, we visualize the lineage of the blessed practice. It is very well, it is very, the best for that visualization is you visualize five rows, right? Five vertical rows. The middle one is the aspect of Dorje Chang, Vajradhara. And then you have Tilopa, Naropa, and so forth. As we say, we have five lines, so it is very good to visualize Manjushri, Lama Umapa, Tsongkhapa, and so forth. So uh, if you can visualize all these figures, that is excellent. Of course, you know, this is something which is a very complicated visualization, so we might not be able to do that. And if you're not able to visualize each one of those figures, you just think they're here, they're right here. This is where they are positioned. Okay, uh, we also have uh, the, the major yidams of the four classes of Tantra, and we have all the lineage lamas of the various Tantric traditions. Okay, so that was the behind, all right? To the right, uh, we have Protector Matriera, Master Asanga, and so forth, that group of um, masters, uh, which is the, one, the ones of the lineage of extensive deeds. To the left, we have Manjushri, uh, Nagarjuna, and his followers, so the lineage of profound view. And to the front, we have the root, a root lama, and all other direct and indirect lamas, everyone who has given us initiations, commentary, advice, instructions, and so forth. So all the lamas are there. Okay, so as you can see, we have established the visualization of the five groups of gurus. And then uh, surrounding them, we have the main deities of Haiz Yoga Tantra. So we're going to have one round of Haiz Yoga Tantra deities with uh, uh, Yamantaka at the front, Guya Samaja to the left, Heruka, to, uh, sorry, Guya Samaja to the right, Heruka to the left, and Kala Chakra at the back. So that is one concentric circle. And then the next circle after that is all the deities of performance tantra. 
Um, oh no, sorry, uh, yoga tantra. Then after that, we have performance tantra. And after that, we have all the deities of action tantra. After that, we have one ring, which is or one circle, which is the thousand Buddhas of the Sion. So these are sutric Buddhas. Below them, we have another circle, which is the Bodhisattvas. Below them, we have another circle, which is solitary realizers. Below them, we have the hearers. Below them, we have the heroes and Dakinis. And below them, we have the Dharma protectors. Okay, so in this way, we establish a visualization with all the objects of refuge. Nothing is missing. Everyone is present here. So as we say, if you can visualize all that, that's excellent. If you cannot, you just think, you know, they're all here and nothing is missing. It's a complete visualization. So as we say, we have established the complete realization of all those figures. And in front of each one of those figures, uh, we visualize that we have a little stand, like a little table that is made out of excellent materials. And on top of this table, we have a volume. So the volume in front of each figure represents the uh, Dharma jewel which is the truth of cessation and the truth of the path that exists within their mind stream. However, it takes the aspect of the text, a volume of a text. It is a text that is radiating light and um, actually speaks out um, the different instructions of the profound and the extensive practices. And as you establish this visualization thing that they are all extremely pleased with me, they're actually looking at me and they're smiling at me right now. So as we say, we have established this main visualization. And now as you have those objects of refuge in front of you, you have to remember and consider their incredible qualities qualities and their kindness so you go through this phase of recollecting their qualities of their body speech and mind until you come to the point where you generate a very strong faith within them and uh, once you generate this uh, strong faith towards the objects of refuge that completely fill their space uh, above you like in the sky as vast as space also, you become aware that you are surrounded by sentient beings uh, around you, right? So to your right, um, you have your father, and your father actually represents all the male people in your life. To your left, you have your mother, and she represents all the females in your life. In front of you, you have enemies. You have those who have directly harmed you or even indirectly caused some harm to you. And then all around you, you have other, you know, friends and um, other neutral sentient beings and so forth. So just as the visualization of the objects of refuge has to be vast, vast as the space above you, Similarly, the visualization of sentient beings around you at the level that you are has to be very vast, like it covers the entire earth. Like, okay, they say that it makes a difference if you make these two visualizations that vast. So um, up to here, what we have done is, first of all, we have established the motivation, then established the visualization. And in that visualization, we see that we are surrounded by uh, all types, the six types of um, sentient beings. All of them have a human aspect. However, each one of them is experiencing their individual suffering. So what we need to do next in order to go for refuge is that we need to establish the causes of refuge. As we, as we have explained, there are two causes of refuge. The first one is fear and the second one is faith. So we begin by establishing the first one, which is fear. And we say that myself and all these sentient beings that surround me, since beginningless time, we have experienced all the suffering in samsara, the general suffering in samsara, and in particular, the suffering that comes with the lower types of migrations. So remember that we have presented this section of the general suffering in samsara and specific types of suffering. 
Okay, so we say that although we have been doing this since beginningless time, uh, still this experience of suffering is not finished. It's not like there is a prescribed type of uh, suffering, right? That you will have to endure suffering for that long. And when you exhaust that time, you don't have to experience it any longer. It's not like this. It has been going on since beginningless time. And if we don't do anything now, to eliminate the causes of this suffering, this situation will just perpetuate itself in the future. So it will just continue in an unendless, unlimited manner again in the future. So unless I abandon this cause of suffering, unless I practice the path now, this suffering will go on forever. So you know that it is very important to abandon those causes of suffering because if I do not abandon the causes of suffering, I will never put an end to this wandering around in cyclic existence. So the important thing here is to consider that samsara is endless, right? It has been since beginningless time and it will go on endlessly unless we do something. So... Um, we say that up to now, I have experienced all the suffering. If I don't do anything about it, I will have to continue experiencing this in the future. However, right now, I'm in a very fortunate situation. I have obtained the precious human rebirth. I have all the right conditions to practice, and therefore I must practice, I must abandon those causes. So we have to continue thinking about this until we generate a sincere sense of fear in order to establish the first cause of refuge. So we, as we say, we meditate on fear and we say just as it is true for myself, it is also true and the same for all other sentient beings. We have experienced every type of suffering in samsara in general and in particular we experience the suffering of the lower migrations. So we're looking for someone who has the power to protect us from all this suffering. And these objects of refuge that I have visualized and established in this space in front of me, they have the complete capacity, the complete total power to protect us from that. So we must generate this sense of confidence, this sense of faith that the objects of refuge have the power to protect us. And we consider that from the very beginning, they trained in a way to generate the mind of bodhicitta for the sake of sentient beings. In the middle, they spent an incredibly long time of three countless great eons um, accumulating different virtuous practices. And at the end, they reached the state of uh, full enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings. And once they reach the state of full enlightenment, they have those magnificent qualities of their bodies, their speech, and their mind. Qualities of the bodies, for example, they are marked with the marks and signs, a total of 108 magnificent signs in their bodies. Their speech um, is qualified by the 60 tones of melodiousness, and their mind is capable of comprehending simultaneously the reality and the variety of all phenomena that exist. At the same time, they are endowed with the uh, incredible quality of immeasurable affection and compassion for every sentient being. So since they have these qualities, they are suitable objects of refuge. We should come to this conclusion of confidence and faith that they are proper objects of refuge. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, the next thing is that we need to totally entrust ourselves to these objects of refuge. Unless we entrust ourselves completely, like you surrender, you entrust yourself to them, unless you do that, uh, it will not bear the results that you're looking for. And the other thing is that, of course, if you totally entrust yourself and you say, I'm not looking anywhere else, for another alternative refuge. I'm not doing this wholehearted, um, 
you know, with a cold heart, thinking, you know, put a little bit of trust to you, but I look somewhere else for protection as well. So it has to be totally wholeheartedly, 100%, you entrust yourself and you go for refuge. So you say, both myself and all these other sentient beings, 100%, we're not looking for any other of objects of refuge. We come to you for refuge from this day onwards until we reach uh, the state of enlightenment. Anything that happens, good or bad, you completely know this. Therefore, you, my Lama, and the three jewels, you are my objects of refuge. So with that intense um, sense of reliance upon them, we begin the recitation. So there are different ways of doing the recitation. The words that we will be reciting is, I go for refuge to the Guru, I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Dharma, I go for refuge to the Sangha. So you can do the recitation of these four and consider these to be one unit. And let's say you want to recite five mantras, five malas, right? Or 500 malas or however many. Um, so you go by saying, I go for refuge to the guru, go for refuge to the dhamma, go for refuge to, to to go for refuge to the guru, go for refuge to the Buddha, go for refuge to the dhamma, go for refuge to the sangha. And then you start again from the beginning. I go for refuge to the guru, to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. All right. Or you could do it separately. I go for refuge to the Guru. 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 Right? And then I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge to the Buddha. And then I go for refuge to the Dharma. I go for refuge to the Dharma. I go for refuge to the Dharma. I go for refuge to the Sangha. I go for refuge to the Sangha. I go for refuge to the Sangha. So any of these two ways is acceptable. So as we recite the formula and we accumulate, we build up the numbers, together with that we have to do the visualization of the descent of nectar. So um, Gishala is saying, from my own experience, I find that the best way to do this accumulation is to stay with one line and recite that for five malas. All right, so you go, you begin by saying, I go for refuge to the guru, I go for refuge to the guru, I go for refuge to the guru. So keep reciting this. Stay with this one recitation until you do five malas. And only after that, move to the second line, which is I go for refuge to the Buddha and so forth. Because if you spend sufficient time with reciting just one line, it gives you the time to do the visualization properly. So as we say, the visualization is that we have the descent of nectar and rays of light. So this nectar and rays of light descend from the bodies of the gurus. Remember in this visualization, uh, we have the five group of gurus and in that we have all the direct and indirect gurus. And then below them we have... Uh, uh, all the Buddhas, then we have Bodhisattvas, solitary realizers, hearers, dakas, and dakinis, and protectors. So when you say go for refuge to the guru, you visualize rays of light with nectar descending from the body of the guru. It comes and enters your crown and also the crown of every other sentient beings. And it flushes away all negativity and obscuration. So here is general negativity and obscur obscuration as well as specific negativity and obscuration we have created in relation to our gurus. So for example, endangering their body, disrespecting their speech, or the advice they had given us and upsetting their mind. So once those, all these negativities and obscurations are removed, we visualize that our body becomes clean and clear and transparent and it radiates light. And at the same time, the, our um, lifespan, our merit, our qualities of realizations uh, and transmission, they all uh, increase, and that in all our lifetimes, the gurus will happily take care of us, and in this way, we will always have the opportunity to experience the nectar of Dharma, both of the profound and the extensive um, instructions. So in this way, we establish a very auspicious interdependence. So think that I have established all this. 
Okay, so we have uh, recited the first line, which is a goal for a future guru, a sufficient number of times with the visualization. So then we move into the next one, which is a goal for a future to the Buddha. And we recite this for five malas. So now again, we do this visualization of the descent of nectar. The nectar will descend from the bodies of the Yidams and the Buddhas. So remember that we have the Yidams or the deities of the four classes of Tantra. We have highest Yoga Tantra, we have Yoga Tantra, Performance Tantra, and Action Tantra. And then uh, below them and around them, we have the thousand Buddhas. Sutric Buddhas. So from the bodies of all the Yidams and the Buddhas, we have this descent of nectar and light. As before, uh, they come and enter our body from the crown to the body of all sentient beings. They purify negativities and uh, obscurations in general, but in particular negativities and obscurations we have created due to being disrespectful towards the Buddhas or disrespectful towards representations of the Buddhas such as destroying statues, stupas and so forth. And once all this negativity is removed, again, we visualize that the body becomes clear and light and transparent and that our life and um, good qualities and realizations and merit increase and that the Buddhas will uh, take care of us for all lifetimes. And we think very strongly that we have established this auspicious interdependence. Okay, the next one is uh, um, reciting a go for refuge to the Dharma, and we recite this again for a similar amount, uh, number of times. So when we do this, we have to do the descent, the visualization of the descent of nectar. This time, the nectar descends from those volumes of text that are placed in those very beautiful uh, tables in front of each one of the figures of the merit field and of the refuge field. So we have said that those uh, texts actually represent the um, realizations of the of the Dharma jewel, the, the truth of path and truth of cessation that exists within the mind stream of all these figures. So the um, nectars with light descend and enter our body. They remove negativities and obscuration in general, but also specifically negativities and obscurations we have created in relation to the Dharma, such as, for example, abandoning the Dharma and so on. And again, the body becomes purified, our lifespan, uh, our merit, our realizations, they all increase. And we think that we establish auspicious interdependence to always have access and being protected by the Dharma. Okay, so we come to the next line, which is a go for refuge to the Sangha. Again, this is something that we recite for five malas. And whilst we do that, we have the time to develop the visualization of the descent of nectar. So now the nectar descends from the bodies of the bodhisattvas, the solitary realizers, the hearers, um, the um, uh, the Dakinis, heroes and Dakinis, and the protectors. So the nectars descend and enter our bodies. They purify negativities and obscurations in general, but in particular negativities and obscurations that come in relation to the Arya Sangha, such as, for example, trying to divide or split the Sangha and so forth. And by removing all these negativities and obscurations, the body becomes uh, clear and light. And um, our merit, our lifespan, our realizations and good qualities increase. We develop a very special uh, interdependence, uh, very auspicious interdependent connection uh, with the Sangha, always to be taken care of by them. So as you can see here, the visualization, you know, most part of the visualization is similar in all cases. Okay, so as for the formula that we recite, you don't absolutely have to do it in Tibetan. You don't have to memorize it in Tibetan. So you can do it in English, you can do it in Chinese, you can even do it in Sanskrit. So you can say Namo Gurubhya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dhammaya, Namo Sangaya. So whichever language 
is suits you best, you can recite it in that language. Okay, so as we say, you, the aim here is to accumulate 100,000 recitations of that formula. And to do that, you would need to have uh, four sessions in a day. The sessions typically will be about one and a half to two hours long. So during the, the, the majority of the session, right? be uh, reciting again and again you will be accumulating your recitations but when we come towards the end of the session so you're about to conclude the session as you come at the end of the session it is said that it is extremely beneficial and very good to meditate on bringing the result of your bodhicitta to the path okay so what do we mean for that so up to now, you have been reciting the verse that says, I go for the guru, I go for the Buddha, and so forth. So you come at the end, and now you, you recite the other verse, the usual verse that we recite for refuge and bodhicitta. And you say, uh, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Okay, so um, at this point, you are aware of the six types of migrating beings that are all around you, and you're aware of their suffering, and you consider this suffering to be unbearable, and you wish for these sentient beings to be separated from their suffering, whether it is the general suffering of samsara or whether it is specific suffering. Okay, so... We consider that um, we make a request to all the objects of refuge. So we make a request to the three uh, jewels and all objects of refuge that we know that they are full of compassion. And we say, I request all of you that uh, these, all these sentient beings will become free from suffering and its causes. As a result of this request, we visualize nectars of descending from the bodies of all the objects of refuge, uh, from the lamas, the, the five groups of lamas, from the yidams, from the buddhas, the bodhisattvas, uh, solitary here, uh, solitary realizers, heroes, um, dakas, dakinis, and protectors from everybody. And the visualization is as before. So the bodies are purified and we establish a special connection. All the negativity is removed and all the good qualities are developed. Okay, so... Then we come to the second part of the verse where it says, by means of practicing generosity and the other perfections, may I reach enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. So at this point, you are thinking that all sentient beings are experiencing suffering due to karma and their afflictions. So you say, I want to practice generosity and through the merit that I create from this uh, generosity, through the merit that I create by practicing pra uh, patience, through the merit that I practice through practicing enthusiastic effort, the merit through practicing concentration, the merit through practicing wisdom, right? So basically the merit through practicing the six perfections and the four means of gathering disciples, may I reach the state of enlightenment. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I reach the state of enlightenment? May I reach it? I will reach it. So I will train in all this, the six perfections and the four ways of gathering disciples in order to um, reach the state of enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So at this point, we, have, we generate aspiring bodhicitta and also engaging bodhicitta. And we have to have a very stay with this thought until we have a very strong feeling of aspiring and engaging bodhicitta. Having generated this, the main figure in the objects of refuge, which is Buddha Shakyamuni, is extremely pleased with us. Be, since he's so pleased with us, a replica uh, separates from his body and comes and dissolves into my body. 
dissolving into my body, now I become Buddha Shakyamuni. I take the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. I generate myself as Buddha Shakyamuni. And now from my heart, as Buddha Shakyamuni, rays of light go out. They strike all six types of migrating beings and all impure environments. By striking them and coming in contact with them, they completely remove all impurities and negativity. So they all become perfectly uh, pure. So all the suffering and the causes of suffering is totally removed and purified. So... It's very good to, at the end to spend just a little, little bit of uh, time to have uh, the pride of having established that. It's a very special visualization and practice. It has great benefit. So once you have done this, then you really have come to the end of the session and you do the dedications and the prayers as usual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as we say, if you want to accumulate 100,000 uh, recitations of the refuge, you're looking at scheduling four sessions a day. Whatever we have presented, what you do in the first session, and you repeat the same thing, the same procedure, visualization, and so forth in the second, the third, and the fourth session. The important thing here is not so much the numbers, how many numbers you accumulate. The most important thing is the visualization and the thinking that goes on through uh, the session. However, we do mention a number and we say you do it 100,000 times. And the reason why we give this number and we aim at accumulating this number is that later on in our life, we can rejoice. It is a difficult practice to do it that many times and to do it so intensively. So once you complete it, later on you can look back at this and say, you know, in my life, uh, I did all this. I did this much practice. So it's for us to rejoice. But as we say, the main thing is to establish the visualization and the thinking. The main thing is to establish the two causes of refuge. That is fear and faith. All right, so that's the important thing. Okay, so obviously we schedule the day here in sessions and between the sessions we have some free time, isn't it? So it is important what we do in between sessions. In between sessions, it is very beneficial to read material that is relevant to going for refuge. So all this material, this presentation that we had in the small scope, where there was, um, where we have this attitude where we are preoccupied about, you know, the next life, the next rebirth, and refuge is important in that. All this material is very beneficial to read in between sessions. It will support the actual practice. Okay, so we still have a little bit of time left, and, uh, you know, we have more preliminaries. The next preliminary will be prostrations. All right, so we come now to having completed the first preliminary, which was going for refuge. The second preliminary is prostrations. So typically in the monastery, if the monks are building up or accumulating the prostrations, they would go to Bodh Gaya to do it, all right? So Bodh Gaya is a place where Buddha Shakyamuni reached enlightenment or manifested enlightenment, and therefore it is a very uh, blessed location. So the ideal time to do it is anywhere between the months of October, November, and December, where the weather there is a little bit cooler. So it's very good to do it there in a blessed place. Uh, however, you, you, know, you could do it at your home, okay? Uh, the thing is that you need to prepare, you need to have a prostration uh, wooden platform. If you can organize this, it would be very good. But again, it depends on what material your floor is made of, right? So you might have a type of floor that is good for prostrations. You would need to prepare something, some protection for your knees and also some protection from your hands because you will be forever touching the wood or the surface. Okay, the first day and at the beginning, when you begin the session, you have to clean the room. You organize um, 
and arrange representations of the body, speech, and mind. You present nice offerings, and then after that, you set the motivation. So just as we did with the previous preliminary, you know, those first steps are the same. Then you go for refuge, uh, you, go for bo you generate bodhicitta, so you can recite the verse for refuge and bodhicitta, and then something for the seven limb prayers. So, for example, it could be Gandhila Gemma that you recite. And when you actually come to the limb of prostration, this is when you begin doing your prostrations. There are two types of prostrations. It's called one is called the full length prostration, and the other one is the half length prostration. So the full length prostration is that you fall on the ground and you stretch out your body completely so that the entire body is stretched out. In the half length prostration, only five points of your body touch the ground. So the two knees, the two hands, and your forehead touch, right? So when we accumulate the 100,000 prostrations, we do it with the full length prostration, all right? So it is a bit more difficult, but you cover more ground uh, with your body. So this is how it's done. Okay, all right, so when we do the prostrations, we put the palms of our hands together. So there's a particular way that we do it, right? So we bend the thumbs and then we put the hands, the two palms together. And if you do it like, the, like this, you see that you have empty space between the two hands that come together. So this empty space that we have in the middle represents selflessness and represents the Dharma body of the Buddha. As for the palms themselves, right, the form or this, you know, this shape that we have here, it represents the form body of the Buddha. So the empty hollow inside is the Dharma body and the two hands, they represent the form body of the Buddha. Then the fact that we have two hands coming together represent method and wisdom. And the fact that we bring them together represents the union of method and wisdom. So when you put the two palms together, you have to think that you establish a very auspicious interdependence to first of all generate that union of method and wisdom and then to maintain it without any degeneration and finally to increase it. Okay, so we put the two hands together with this understanding, you know, representing uh, the Dharma body of the Buddha, the form body of the Buddha, the union of method and wisdom. And initially, we place them at the crown of the head. When you put them at the crown of the head, you are actually recalling the qualities of the Buddha of the body of the Buddha, and that places a special imprints for yourself to become adorned with the marks and signs of the Buddha, and especially to establish the Usnishna, the crown protrusion of the Buddha. Next, we put the hands, the palms together at the level of the throat. And here we're remembering the qualities of the speech of the Buddha, and these um, uh, places the imprints for us to develop the same type of melodious voice of the Buddha and have all the qualities of the speech of the Buddha. So we place the hands here at the chakra of enjoyment. The third one is to put the hands at the level of the heart and there we remember all the qualities of the mind of the Buddha and we place imprints for establishing omniscience. Okay, so um, we have just explained that we can uh, touch uh, three points in the body. However, sometimes you see people touching four points. So the extra point is here at the forehead. So crown, forehead, throat, and heart. So whether you want to touch four points or three points, that's fine. It doesn't, it, there's no difference. However, usually we do it in the three points. And if you do it in the three points, you are signifying that you are removing all the negativity of your own body, 
speech and mind. And in this way, you place imprints to establish the totally purified body, speech and mind of a Buddha. So if you do just the three, it refers to this purification of body, speech and mind. All right, so this is uh, how we actually do a prostration. As we say, first of all, we do this, we touch the three points. And having done this, we are, ready, we are ready now to fall into the ground and we stretch the arms and we stretch the whole body and we touch the ground. Okay, so once we touch the ground, the next thing is that we need to rise up straighten the body and put the, the hands again up here. So we start in this position and we finish in this position. Okay, so it is very important that you, once you go down into the ground, then you have to rise and straighten your body. Do not delay strain, staying down on the ground. Some people, you know, especially if they have done a lot of prostrations, they come towards the end of prostrations and you see some reluctance to come up and they just want to stay down on the ground. You cannot stay on the ground. You have to raise up. And also, when you come up, you have to bring your body completely straight. They say that it is a fault to, um, you know, not straighten up your body. Sometimes you see people who do the prostration, but they don't straighten up the body. They remain like half bent and then go for the next prostration without straightening the body. So these are actually faults. These are mistakes. Or you see people who, as we say, you know, remain lying on the ground. Or when they rise up, they look to the right and left and they start chatting with their friends before they do the next prostration. If you do prostrations, it has to be proper dharma activity. So if you do it, you have to do it properly. So they say that if you don't straighten up your body and remain kind of like half bent, uh, this is going to create, um, a re you might take a rebirth as a human, but you will be bent, right? Your body will not be straight. Another important point is that your forehead must definitely touch the ground. When you go down, you go down. You really have to touch the ground. And uh, if you don't do that, you can either take a rebirth as a human that will have some fleshy kind of like protrusions here on your head, uh, or you might take a rebirth in a particular type of the health. The other thing is that when you go down, right, your, uh, the palms have to be completely stretched. You should not have them in fists. If you have them in feast, you're going to be reborn as an animal. And the last point, we mentioned that the proper way to put together the palms is to put them together so that you have empty space, cavity in between them. Putting the palms together completely flat is a non-Buddhist way of, doing, of putting the palms together. And it creates a very inauspicious interdependence. It's like, you know, you're not going to follow the Buddhist path in the future. You're going to follow a non-Buddhist path. So don't have the palms flap together. Make sure you have them cupped a little bit. Yeah. All right. So as we say, the way that we schedule this is, first of all, we set the motivation. Then after that, we we are certain that we do this for the sake of all sentient beings and visualize all the objects of refuge. And after that, we perform those prostrations and we say that prostrations have to be done uh, in accordance with the Dharma and they have to be, there has to be a good quality. And as we do that, it is very good to combine it with an understanding of uh, emptiness, the three rounds of emptiness. So myself, who is the prostrator, the prostrations and the activity of prostrating, they're all empty of inherent existence. So as we stand there in that particular, having the, ha the palms together, we should think that we are standing the same way that 
um, Chen Rezik is standing with uh, holding the jewel in front in his uh, heart. And uh, from that jewel, we have a cloud of Samandrabandra offerings emanating. So we visualize that countless rays of light emanate from that uh, jewel. And... Um, um, you know, pervade, you know, make offerings and pervade the whole of space. And uh, at the beginning, before we start doing the whole block of prostrations, we recite three times the multiplying mantra, which is Namo Manjushri, Namo Shushri, Namo Uttamashri Shoha. So this is recited three times, and then we start with the actual prostrations. And when we do the main body of the prostrations, it is very good to do it in combination with the confession, confession to the 35 uh, Buddhas. Okay. So uh, this is uh, how we um, do this. And um, they say that it is very good when we do the prostrations to incorporate the four aspects of immeasurable in the practice. So the thing for that is that we do it for the sake of countless sentient beings. So that's the first immeasurable, the first countless, let's call it countless countless sentient beings and we are prostrating in front of countless objects of refuge not just one or two and we're doing this having emanated countless bodies so don't just imagine that you're prostrating with one body you have to prostrate with countless bodies and each body is actually offering or making countless prostrations. So we have four aspects of things that are countless. So as we say, in this way, we can do this practice of accumulating 100,000 uh, prostrations. It can be done with four sessions a day. You will have to see how many prostrations you want to fit in each one of the sessions. Uh, there are people who can complete this preliminary in about a month and 20 days uh, or two months and so forth. So it depends on the individual. But remember, the important thing is not the numbers. The important thing is the thinking and the visualization and how you process the whole practice. And the prostrations have to be done properly. It has to be good quality prostrations according to the Dharma. So in this way, you schedule four sessions uh, in a day and uh, towards the end of the session, it's all, you always have to conclude with your prayers and your dedication. Okay, so today we finish the first two of these preliminaries, the refuge and the prostrations. Technically, in the, in the list, the next one is the hundred uh, recitation of the hundred syllable mantra. However, in order to give an, an explanation for that, the person who receives must have initiation. If the person doesn't have initiation, this explanation, instead of benefiting, will be harmful. So next time we like we're going for the time being, we're going to skip the presentation of the hundred syllable mantra because it has to do with Tantra. And instead, we will go into the mandala and the mixema. Okay, so this is enough for tonight. We've gone over time.